Welcome, everybody. My name is Mila Batner. I'm a premier field engineer at the Global Business Support Team in Middle East and Africa. And today, I would like to talk with you around the improvements we have made when it comes to security in Windows 8.1. You probably have realized that the threat landscape, if we look into today, has really changed. And the conversations which we have as IT professionals with our customers has really changed from how do you protect your parameter into how do you protect your users, how do you protect your data itself. So it's really a driving change when we look into how the threat landscape uh, is happening. When we look into the megatrends itself, so talking about cloud, talking about social, mobility, is one of the key areas where we keep seeing our users, so our end users we have we see in the offers or even in the consumer space who are keep pushing us. So they want to be mobile with their devices and even we as Microsoft are committed to be a mobile first, cloud first company. So we need to make sure that we are able to securely provide the capabilities our users are asking for in a mobile-first world. If you have configured previously your environment to secure each of those individual layers and presume that there will be no devices coming outside of the company, then guess what? You need to reassess the threat. You need to be able to understand what are the user's requirements based on the mobility megatrend. And I think, just to show you, visualize you a little bit on what we are talking about. So when we had uh, previously, like back in 2008, 2009, a more, let's say, defined environment where we knew exactly as IT professionals, okay, so we have X model of computers, we have X model of desktop PCs, X model of laptops, and we have those uh, huge servers which we have somewhere uh, uh, hidden in the office. This was all, all defined. We knew exactly the structure, we knew exactly the configuration, and we were keeping using ITSM, IT Service Management, to making sure that everything is uh, under control. Now, if you look into what's happening since last year, uh, since we started around the discussion around mobility, and um, bring your own device and all that, so really the parameter itself is really disappearing, right? We're talking about cloud solutions, and this is just to make it clear, not only within Microsoft, right? If you look into our competitors as well, they are having the same conversations now with their customers because the need of the user itself has changed. So the user wants to be able to bring his beautiful tablet he used at home to the office, he wants to have the latest smartphones as a company device. He wants to even have a device which he can use in the consumer space, so at home, while at the same time also using that device in the enterprise. So we need to find a balance and making sure that providing the users with the experience they want, while at the same time securing this, uh, uh, this device, the solution, and most importantly, the data itself. And just to give you like some uh, numbers around that, did you know that in the 36 biggest airports in the U.S. that there's allowed around 360k devices lost every year? And now, as far as I re recall that case study, around 40% of them were just data protected, so data encrypted, which means you probably have noticed also on TV, on the various of blogs, that there were some media discussions around data loss at big enterprises. Chances are that this happened because of, case, uh, because of cases like that. So really we need to make sure that we are able to uh, serve our end users in a secure way and bring your own device, BYOD, is for sure something you uh, in your IT team, your IT staff, or uh, with you on a uh, exact level have started discussing, right? And one of the greatest examples here was what I saw personally when it comes to BYOD. It all started really when the first tablet went into the enterprise. So because of the CTO, the CEO, they wanted to have those beautiful tablet devices, and not only from Windows, not only from Microsoft devices, but also from our competitors. They wanted to have them. They wanted to have their mails on them. And guess what happened? Our CTO wanted to have that device. Our end users started requesting those devices because they wanted to have the same experience like the CTO has. So BYOD is, in fact, a real top priority, while at the same time a big challenge. 
And I'm not saying it in a, let's say, bad way. I say it as a big opportunity for everyone to explore new potentials to uh, accelerate business opportunities. That's why when we look into all those mega trends, social, mobility, looking into Windows devices, there was a need for us as Microsoft to improve and invest a significant amount of uh, our budget into the Windows platform as well as specifically into security. We wanted to drive new innovation, we wanted to have new security capabilities based on priorities, based on new techniques we see by malware engineers, by professional hackers and all that. And what I really want to make clear is as much as we innovate itself, right, as uh, IT professionals, as uh, Microsoft for Windows and all that, guess what? The attackers are also finding new ways to explore new capabilities to uh, gain access to data, to gain access to uh, identities. Did you know, and uh, this is based on a, of a McAfee research by Robert Silicano, that around 75% of users use the same password on every site they're visiting. This is like a huge number. Now guess what is happening in there is the attacker knows about it as well, right? So he presumes that um, that some of the, the, the targeted users he's aiming for is using the same password on the other website. The attacker is trying to steal that uh, that credential from a let's say a from a not so much secure website, right? Because we are using it, remember, we call it 75% of websites we are using the same password. So he's using, uh, gaining access from website A, and then he's trying basically to gain access to your banking account, to your enterprise credentials, and so on. And that's why it is really important to think about, okay, what are the, what is the password I want to go with? Do, and making sure that every website you're visiting has their own password, has a strong password. Right? It's not enough to say my password is password or my password is 1234. No, we need to make sure that we utilize strong passwords on every website. And uh, I just pulled up a screenshot here, and this is from a real website. And I just want to highlight it. This website is an online portal. Users can go and buy credentials. So this is exactly what we are talking about when it comes to identity theft, right? So just to make it clear for you, there's real, uh, there's a real cyber crime behind it and people are paying lots of money to get those credentials, right? Here you can see a few examples out of the United States. You can buy very conveniently with the credit card uh, some uh, identities. So there is really an easy to access black market when it comes to identities, when it comes to credit cards, social network credentials, and so on. We need to make sure that the personal information, the PII data, will be secured and that your data is not ending up on those websites. And those are really just a few points we've been working on when designing Windows 8, 8.1, and of course moving forward now with the uh, release of uh, update one. So we really put security as the number one priority for us as a company. Those are just a few more examples. One of the examples I keep talking also uh, at Microsoft conferences is the case of Lockheed Martin. So basically what Lockheed Martin said is that most of their IT budget is going right now in the security investments and the security measurement of their supply chain because they kind of say, okay, so we know that our defense is strong enough for the current uh, threats and that their attackers know about that. So they are looking after the suppliers. So who's bringing, let's say, who's bringing the milk into this Lockheed Martin? Who's bringing the, the wheelchair, uh, the chairs and so on? So they're looking after that. So this is another way how this so-called perfect storm is happening. If you're looking into BYOD, there's a really increasing number of devices connecting to corporate resources. 
So if I just look now at my desk, I have two phones with me. I got the uh, Lenovo Carbon, the primary device, and I got two Surface with me, right? So I didn't have that, like, I think, two years ago, right? I was having one primary device, and that was it, and that was enough for me. But now I prefer to have many devices, many form factors, different form factors, depending on my need. I prefer going with my Surface to the next meeting rather with my laptop, right? I prefer working with a tablet uh, on a, at home rather than openly starting my desktop machine. So we really need to assess this new BYOD scenario and make it uh, an enable secure BYOD, basically. And now let's really drive into Windows 8.1 and some of the new improvements and new capabilities we release with it when it comes to security. The strategy of Windows 8.1 security and the investment area are divided into three pillars. The first one is identity and access control. So everything around how do I gain access securely to uh, certain areas of my computer, to certain uh, areas of the network, and so on. The second pillar is information protection. So this is all about data protection. How do I secure the documents I have on my computer, on my tablet, or on my phone? Third pillar, malware resistance. When we look into malware resistance, this is all about how do I secure my computer, my Windows devices against attackers from outside the network, against even attackers who just try to plug in a USB thumb drive with malicious content to gain access again to my computer. So this is our investment areas when we're looking into security, and I would like to really dive into each of them with you and talk about the new capabilities of Windows 8.1. To begin with, let's focus on identity and access control. When we look into identity access control, there were three main components which made uh, it possible for us to uh, go into the next step, taking the next step really when it comes to identity and access control. The first one I would like to talk with you is around virtual smart cards. Now previously, we, uh, a lot of enterprises were uh, investing uh, really lots of money into having physical smart cards issued per employee to enable two-factor authentication. Now the problem with these physical smart cards is not that they are not secure, in fact they are really secure, but it has certain limitations, right? First of all, it costs a lot of money. Second of all, you cannot really re uh, reuse that same physical smart card for other employee. Imagine the scenario the employee leaves the company, or let's say uh, there's a female employee got married and it took the name of the husband, right? So those are many scenarios where you need to make sure to have, uh, where, it, where you will have new costs generated. And in my point of view, sometimes even unnecessary costs, right? So there was a need for us to reassess smart card business. So what we did is basically, we had already the uh, beautiful TPM chip part of most enterprise computers. So we thought about how would we virtualize the same capabilities which a physical smart card offers us today and put it, put it in a secure way under the TPM chip and offer uh, the same capabilities like a physical smart card, but virtually. So with Windows 8.1 release, we are introducing virtual smart card capabilities to enable strong two-factor authentication, which will eliminate you the cost of buying physical smart cards and eliminate also the challenges when it comes to physical options. Looking into biometrics, biometrics is, let's say for me personally, one of my passions because I strongly believe that in the future, now I'm not talking about the tomorrow or next week or even next year, but in the future, like in the next five to ten years, that we will use a more convenient way of authentication. And one of the scenarios I really believe in is biometrics, because biometrics is just so user convenient. You imagine that you just need your finger to authenticate against uh, your computer and 
that is for you. You don't have to think about all the passwords for different websites. You don't have to think about, okay, what was my password again on my uh, domain account? Oh boy, I need to change my uh, domain credentials again, and there's a notification coming up from Active Directory, and so on. And we will dive into biometrics also afterwards. The third area is the test proof identity. So test proof identity is all about how do we utilize again the TPM chip to protect against identity protection and do identity attestation. And we will cover that also. Let's talk first about TPM, Trusted Platform Module. TPM has been a while, uh, has been part of uh, our uh, design and features and so on. But the problem we see uh, in, the, in the OEM landscape is basically two things. We see that most uh, uh, enterprise uh, computers, laptops, uh, are, have, are having a TPM chip, which is great. So we can utilize the TPM chip for many security scenarios. But if you look into the consumer space, it is really not there where we wish it would be, right? We want to provide the same security standard to consumers and enterprises. So this is our opportunity. We want to dramatically improve security for consumer and BYOD scenarios. If you look into our goals in 8.1, that's why. So what we did basically is we sit down with our OEM partners and we said we want to drive the adoption of connected standby architecture. And we all agree that this is something we need to do. We have been working strongly with Intel to make PTT pervasive on all uh, processors. And now what we would, uh, we would announce, what we did announce uh, at TechEd last year is that TPM moving forward in 2015 will be officially part of the Windows certification requirements. That means that any device our OEM partners ship after 2015 will have a TPM chip. And one of the common uh, interest areas for me is also the phone, right, the Windows phones. And just as an FYI for you, right, every time we talk about some of those security features uh, on Windows, it is at the same time applicable also for the phone. So. Any, most of the phones, most of the Windows Phone 8 devices we ship, or our OEM partners ship, more specifically speaking, do also have a TPM chip. Now that we know the trustworthy hardware underneath, let's start drilling into each of those new security capabilities. Let's start with biometrics. Now, if we look into the opportunity or history itself, Biometrics or fingerprint authentication is nothing new to us, right? We have been introduced, we have introduced that security feature with the release of Windows XP. We did a lot of improvements when we shipped Windows 7, when we introduced the Windows Biometric Framework. But the problem was always the user experience itself because we had dependencies on third party enrollment and drivers. So enrollment tools, uh, uh, system drivers for the fingerprint sensor. And what happened basically is users wanted to use biometrics, fingerprint authentication, but they were utilizing tools from, uh, from third parties in order to do the uh, first time enrollment, which was really not that great, right? So I still remember from my personal experience that it took sometimes like nine to ten attempts for me in order to get fingerprint work. And guess what? Even I stopped using fingerprint at that time and moved back to the traditional legacy password combinations, right? So there's a need for us as Microsoft uh, in the, the Windows team to improve those capabilities. So due to this user experience, if we look at the adoption rate across our OEM partners, it was not really there yet, right? Neither our OEM partners for PCs nor for tablets wanted really to have biometrics part of their experience. There were also, beside all this user experience, there's also a cost factor, right? So there's an additional cost when in adding those sensors in there. So what have we done in Microsoft and the Windows security team in order to resolve that and make really biometrics as the best experience for authentication? We 
decided to drive the adoption in consumer enterprise. We made biometrics part of the Windows experience. And now you can really just go in Windows 8.1 under setting in the modern UI and do the biometric enrollment. We, have, we take care of the rest. Now, some of you might recall the picture I'm showing you on the right top side. For those who are not aware of it, basically there was a case, uh, and I believe it was in Brazil, and what happened was basically in the hospital there were five uh, doctors and their clocking system in, uh, in the hospital was based on fingerprint authentication. And what was happening basically is they were doctors, they were smart people, and they built uh, fake uh, fingers, like plastic fingers, and then they gambled every week and said, okay, so who had to go to the hospital this week, while at the same time the four other doctors were going out for golfing. Right? I think it took like a year till they found out it was a big case. And the point I'm trying to make here is, while fingerprint is really great, biometrics, we push it a lot, there is also some sort of technology choices you need to be aware of. So there are different kind of readers as well. So there are optical readers, thermal readers, capacitive, capacitive readers, and even ultrasound readers. When we at Microsoft talk about so-called modern readers, they have three characteristics. The first one, it is three, it supports 3D analysis. Second, it has likeness detection. And lastly, it is touch-based. And really, what, what what makes me especially proud is the likeness detection part and 3D analysis. Because this offers us really the capabilities of making sure that it is not, again, a fake finger attempt. And that we can make sure and verify that the user who is authenticating is a real user it is his finger, and he is confirming the authentication. This is one of the examples on the bottom right side of one of those uh, uh, prototypes we have been working on with our partners. Now let's talk a little bit around virtual smart cards and ad adoption, what it is, and so on. If we look into virtual smart cards, the biggest problem we had in the past was it's just not ready for BYOD. It's not ready and it's not used. Like the user experience wasn't that good, right? So I know from um, the Microsoft experience itself, we had a website. We were going through the website and we tried to add our physical smart card in and then it was trying to build the virtual smart card out of it and so on. It was a hassle. And guess what? If, if I don't like it, how should I evangelize that security capability, right? So. With the release of Windows 8.1, we had we did some significant improvements around that to make virtual smart cards ready for BYOD. In a nutshell, virtual smart cards uh, utilize a TPM chip to store the authentication, encryption, signing uh, experience, and so on. It addresses the key challenges with existing MFA solutions, and our ultimate goal was that we enable an easy to deploy uh, virtual smart card which is cost-effective and always ready on all the Windows devices across the ecosystem. So what we did with the release of 8.1, we introduced new APIs for developers to provision BYOD scenarios. So basically, imagine now a modern app, really a simple modern app. You click on, you, you go to your modern start screen, you click on the virtual smart card app, and it will automatically provision you the virtual smart card as soon as you authenticate it once with either your uh, Active Directory credentials, your physical smart card, or any other authentication which is defined by your IT team. Now let's look into information protection. And specifically, let's talk about device encryption. So. Uh, BitLocker, Microsoft BitLocker administration monitoring, device encryption. Let's look into device revocation. So all about EFS, encrypted file system, and one of the new cool features called remote business data removal. 
And lastly, let's look, talk a little bit around safe sharing. So Azure Active Directory, Office IRM, Azure Right Management. So this is really all like Azure part based on the cloud solution or our cloud first uh, strategy, Office IRM, to make sure that the email you're sending out, for example, is really just reaching out to the person you're intended to send it out and that he cannot, for example, forward the email, do a reply all when he shouldn't do it and so on. Let's talk around this encryption first. Now, traditionally, if you look into the Windows uh, landscape and our devices landscape, it was mainly part of our business additions, right? But we realized that due to BYOD bring your own device, we needed to enable disk encryption scenarios to consumer devices as well because they are accomplishing now business scenarios. We need to be able to protect the system itself and not just the data. So what do we do about that? We decided that device encryption will be made available on all editions of Windows we ship. It will require connected standby certified devices, but again, we made sure that there's a low overhead and that we will enable disk encryption for them. Looking into one of the new cool features I mentioned earlier, RBDR, so Remote Business Data Removal. By the way, if you have attended earlier sessions from me or from other colleagues around security, you might uh, be familiar with the security feature with the old uh, name which was called Remote Wipe. So there was a, a name change around this feature uh, and I, I personally like the new name more Remote Business Data Rule because that's really describing what it's really doing, right? So RBDR's goal was to basically uh, identify the, uh, the data you have on your computer, if it's business related or if it's private. If it's uh, business related, it will do an EFS, encrypted file system uh, encryption, and it will protect the data through the credential locker. Now, let me explain you several real world scenarios. So, imagine you as a company, as an enterprise, you're using work folders, or you have the mail app, or you're utilizing, uh, well, you're utilizing the mail app and you get several attachments on it, right? So what happens traditionally is that employee who has a lot of PII data from the company leaves the company. And he's not the nice guy who was bringing back to the laptop. So now traditionally, uh, you probably could save some data, but not all, right? So there might be a data leakage, and what really happens in the background is this employee leaves the company, goes to the new company, gets a similar role, and presents presentations and projects, and say, hey, new boss, you know, do you remember the project you asked me to do last day? I'm done already, and I, he just updated the day. Now, how do, we, how do we resolve those scenarios? How do we secure our business data? And that's where RBDR comes in. So imagine the business data is under your work folders, right? Another new uh, uh, feature we introduced when we shipped Windows Server 2012. All data which is under work folders, which is under mail app, all attachment under mail, will be EFS encrypted. Now that's the first part. So that's already good. It's EFS encrypted. Now the second component is we bring some sort of manageability in there. Now enterprise IT professionals are getting the ability to utilize Exchange Active Sync policies or and and or uh, mobile device management capabilities of OMADM to execute a wipe command. And this wipe command, now really here comes the beauty, will not just wipe the entire computer it will wipe specifically those business data. So it will, what happens really is it will destroy the EFS encryption key and make it inaccessible for the user to, uh, to open those documents anymore. This feature, RBDR, Remote Business Data Removal, is today available for the mail app, for attachments saved through the mail app, 
as well as workforce. We got a very strong commitment across Microsoft developers to implement RBDR across MSFT apps. And we will, as Microsoft, drive the adoption for third-party apps and DLP products. Let's look into mobile resistance and with that into device integrity. So all about UEFI, Unified Accessibility Firmware Interface, Trusted Boot, and then moving over to online safety. So Windows Defender, Smart Screen, App Container for modern apps, as well as some vulnerability mitigations like address-based layout randomization, ASLR, and DEP. Trust by Verify is about new ways to verify uh, the device identity in a true remote uh, to cloud cap with, uh, with cloud capabilities. Look, let's start with trusted boot and a trusted and measured boot. Now, the problem we had in Windows 7 was, if you look into the end-to-end -end, uh, boot process, we had the BIOS time, right? So BIOS kicks in. An OS loader starts, third-party drivers, and then uh, if, if the customer has an anti-malware software, it will start, and then Windows starts. Now, the problem here was that malware engineers, hackers, could load their malware as an OS loader. It will uh, start as a third-party driver. It will start. Now, what we did with the release of Windows 8 was we made sure that we verify every component we are loading as part of the boot. We are verifying the signature, the certificate, and all that. And only if it's certified and we confirm it's legitimate, then we will start that uh, DLL executable whatsoever. So we are making sure that the end-to-end -end boot experience is secure. So what happens in Windows 8 is native UEFI kicks in. OS loader gets checked, is it uh, verified? Yes, anti-malware solution starts now before third-party drivers. So this is another new capability. It's called Early Launch Anti-Malware, ELAN. Anti-malware software starts, and then third-party drivers, and then Windows log on. What we did on top of it is also Measure Boot. So Measure Boot will give you the capability to Basically, you will have a lock file secured under the TPM, which will uh, protocol the entire boot process, right? And then, and I will cover remote attestation service afterwards, this service can utilize those locks to do even some more security features, and I will talk about that as well. Let's look into probable PC help. And this is another really cool feature when we look into Windows 8, 8.1. So the assumption with Pro PC Health, the challenge was, we say, okay, UAP is fine, Unified Accessible Firmware Interface, it is great, it is way faster, it's total performance and security, it helps a lot, trusted boot, very effective, but still, there's no promise, right, that Volver is able to access the computer. So we wanted to offer our ISVs some opportunities. The opportunity is called Probable PC Health or Remote Health Analysis and Remote Attestation. So in Windows 8.1, we will deliver remote health analysis services through Windows. And we will work with our ISVs to really adapt this model. What am I talking about? So this is a high-level architecture graph. Imagine your Windows client starts. It will send periodic heartbeats to a cloud service, which will include measured boot log as well as the action center status. So action center status, for those to recall, is all about uh, is my firewall on, Am I, do I have all updates, and so on. Now this cloud service will do the, uh, consume the data, do some analysis, and then the analysis and response will be sent back to the Windows client. This will include machine remediation recommendations as well as account remediation. As you can see here, this is another proof of how much we want to make sure 
that the end-to-end -end Windows experience is secured and is really ready for BYOD. We start working with a lot of ISVs and we see the first ISVs coming up uh, and releasing their products and we will make sure to highlight these and make it more uh, broader uh, available for you. Now let's look into Windows Smart Screen as well as Defender. Now the problem when I looked into the internet landscape and internet threat landscape was always Okay, so it's nice that we have Internet Explorer, where it's good, we have Windows Smart Screen, and yes, it protects a lot of scenarios already for application reputation services, so that's all great. Right. But in reality, users or Internet Explorer is not the only way to access the Internet, right? There are third-party uh, uh, browsers, there are mail apps, and so on. So there was a need, I think, for us to reassess how we do application reputation uh, today. And what engineering decided on that why is we take out Windows Smart Screen, well, Internet Explorer Smart Screen from IE, and we make it part of the operating system layer itself. So now it is part of the operating system, and any browser, anything which goes from the Internet can make use of it. And now, even if you open a malicious website through a third-party browser and you start to want to download something, Smart Screen will warn you. And it will tell you that it is not recommended to visit that website, uh, it is not recommended to download that uh, file. Are you really sure? Uh, do you really trust this publisher? So this is not part of the operating system itself. If you look into Windows Defender, it has been part in any and all the editions of Windows. It's part of it. But the problem with Windows Defender was always it was more an anti-spyware solution rather than time over. And we realized that we want to protect our users even more and we realized that certain users will uh, typically not really install afterwards an anti-malware solution. So with uh, the release of Windows 8, and 8.1, Update 1, and so on, we decided, okay, we take the next step for Windows Defender, and we make it a full-size anti-malware and anti spyware solution. It utilizes even the same pattern files, like system center and Adform protection. So by now, the only difference between Windows Defender and SCAP is, in fact, the manageability layer. So because systems and app protection offers you the management interface as well as uh, the network layer, so that it can scan through the network. With that, let me just uh, summarize it really. If you look into Windows 8.1 and uh, Windows 8.1 Update 1 or Windows 8 and all the updates in general, right? We made it make, we, made, we try to make sure that security is a top priority, and not only uh, we wanted to have it for ourselves, no, we want to offer the security you as enterprise as well as consumer need. We need to make sure that we are ready for scenarios like bring your own device, like megatrends such as social, mobile, cloud, big data, and so on. To summarize it, let me just highlight some of the key enhancements we introduced. If you look into identity and access control, we want to move away from password. And I, like I said, it's not something we will do probably within a day or so, but really it will be a multi-year investment for us as a company or also as an industry, I would even say, to move away from passwords. And we see that. We see our competitors releasing smartphones with touch, ID, uh, touch uh, authentication capabilities. We see more and more OEMs getting interested around those modern readers. We will get there eventually. So Biometrics offers a stronger single-factor authentication capability. We made sure that Virtual Smart Card is ready for BYOD. We introduced new APIs to make it easy to deploy two-factor authentication. We will utilize the TPM chip, which will be part of the Windows certification program beginning of 2015 even more to prove identities, to make really sure that the person who's authenticating, authenticating, who's ordering something, and all those different scenarios, and scenarios even we might cannot imagine right now, can be secured. 
if you look into information protection, it's really important for us, right? It's really important that we are able to protect corporate data as well and specifically in looking into BYOD. That's why we made sure that device encryption itself will be part of any Windows uh, edition we ship. RBDM, remote business data removal, is another key component and we really made this, uh, we really want to push it so that we can securely destroy the EFS encrypted file system key and uh, that the users who, for example, leave the company are unable to access corporate apps, corporate data anymore. And one of the key investments also for us is, of course, Azure RMS, right management services. And with that, all of those advantages we bring from the Microsoft Cloud stack into the enterprises. If you look into malware resistance, many great capabilities there. We really changed the conversation there as well. So we maintain a high level of device integrity with our big investment in UAFI. And one of the ironic parts around UAFI is always people thought when we start talking about UAFI that it is a Microsoft invention and the why, why the heck is Microsoft doing that? But really, it, it is not the case, right? So UEFI is originally uh, designed by Intel. It was called EFI, EFI, and uh, Intel decided to give it over to the uh, to the open forum. So there's an open forum uh, based out of uh, many different companies, many OEMs, uh, companies like Apple, Microsoft, Acer, and so on. So we're all part of this uh, UEFI forum, and we discuss the capabilities, the architecture, and so on. Yes, UEFI is definitely, when it comes specifically to model resistance, one of the key components, and we will push it in the right way in order to secure our uh, customers and the Windows experience. So out of UEFI, we have the capabilities like Trusted Boot with early launch anti malware so the ability that the first driver we load is from our uh, anti, -malware uh, anti malware solution, measure boot, the ability to say, okay, what has been loaded really? What are the, has it been verified and all that during the boot process? We can see, we have a lot now about the boot process. So those are all uh, capabilities coming from UEFI. And even, uh, and of course, let's not forget, secure boot. So the ability to make sure that the OS loader even is verified and that no mobile can tamper there. When we look into uh, internet itself, so all of what, what's coming from the internet, smart screen, great investment story there as well. We moved away and we took that feature from Internet Explorer and made it straight part of Microsoft's Windows solution, so it's part of Windows and we can offer this uh, security cable you know, independent of which browser, which uh, clients you're using. Windows Defender, also great story, it's now a full size. Uh, anti-mobber and anti-spiral solution. And of course, when we look into modern apps itself, so Windows Store apps, LOB apps, we made sure that these apps are sandbox. So it means that every app you're launching today will have its own sandbox and he needs to utilize specified APIs in order to do certain tasks. Like if an app wants to communicate uh, to the printer or wants to utilize your microphone webcam, he needs to get your confirmation before that. He cannot do it by default. So this is all about sandbox apps. If you look into the system and app vulnerabilities, so there are less exploitables really based out of a, uh, due to ASLR, address space layout randomization and data execution prevention depth. So ASLR, the idea is basically every time you, uh, every time we load a DLL on your computer, we will randomly select the area in memory where we load it because previously we didn't do that. So the problem was mobile engineers knew exactly where certain DLLs would be loaded, so we fixed it with ASLR. And this is really all about the Windows uh, 8.8, 8.1 .8, and Update 1 stack and talking about security. I hope that uh, it gave you a lot of insights around uh, our security strategy and security capabilities. I strongly believe that we as a company and, uh, and specifically looking into Windows, we are going into the right direction 
And I see really when I, as a premier field engineer, go to customers to those large enterprises and talk about those security capabilities, that it is really changing the conversation and that we are talking now with the CTOs, with IT professionals around specific scenarios rather than features and how do we enable those scenarios. I personally would like also uh, to thank everyone who attended today's webcast and it's a great opportunity to speak to all of you and uh, I really enjoyed it and I want to thank also the team uh, from the GBS webcast team who made this possible and I really recommend that you go on our TechNet blog, uh, so uh, Mia GBS TechNet blog, there you will find all the upcoming webcasts from all the other, uh, all my peers across the technology, all the other premier field engineers as well as people from support engineering and just really go into those webcasts and explore all the capabilities across the Microsoft stack because we will be showing you lots of insights and lots of real world scenarios on how to make the most of your Microsoft stack. With that, I would like to thank you and I hope that you have enjoyed it.